You're listening to Lighthouse Conversations, brought to you by Lighthouse Haven, a spiritual home for your awakening soul. Lighthouse Conversations is a show where awakening souls gather to be inspired, connected, and enlightened. Spiritual spark plug and host, Chelly Canales, that's me, will guide you through the twists and turns of your journey to a safe haven where you are finally free to live your best light. Each episode contains a conversation with a guest who has gone through a spiritual awakening, detailing their unique and life-changing experiences in an intimate and candid way. Although everyone's experience is as unique as they are, we all share one common thread. We're all seeking something. So come join us on this journey and be prepared to leave with resources that will supercharge you into inspired action. Here's today's episode. Hello, hello, awakening souls. Goodness, uh, I missed you last week, but I'm back. (laughs) I'm working through a few things, trying to figure life out. There's some amazing flow that's happening. There's some resistance that's happening. And it's a really interesting um, dynamic between wanting to be in flow and going with spirit and working through my intuition. And the other side of that is wanting to have very tangible things done at very certain specific times, which to me is like yesterday, let's do this yesterday. Um, So I'm having to have some patience with myself and helping myself stay in alignment. And this episode is really great. My friend Andrea talks to us about how we can stay in alignment while still being in flow with all of these changes that are happening around us in the world at all times. And we also discuss what is the true meaning of value. And I don't know about you, but to me, my whole life from the media, you know, from of course television shows, from people around us, you always hear that you are more valuable because you have more money. And money is a wonderful thing. It's an incredible tool to do such great things in the world. But if that's the only way that we can see ourselves as being valuable, what happens when work goes away? And this, you know, pandemic has brought just devastation to the arts, to events, um, just to name a few. And, you know, if you think about all of the jobs that go into making those things, things that require people to gather, well, those things are not happening anymore. Okay, so if your work isn't happening and you don't have, you know, the professional f- fulfillment of doing your job and you're furloughed or you're fired and suddenly your work has dried up, what does that do to your self esteem? I think it's pretty unhealthy if that's the metric by which we judge ourselves and others on. So how can we look at our entire lives and see the wealth, the riches of love, of relationships, of the people in our life that show up for us every day, of the beauty of trees when going on nature walks and connecting with the earth? There's so much here. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Andrea, and she talks a lot about these barriers that keep us from living that life and and being that true aligned self. I think she's got a lot of great wisdom, and I really look forward to sharing it with you. Take care of yourselves. I'm thinking about you, and just know that you're not alone. And this is going on a really long time, this pandemic, but there will be an end to it, and you're going to come out of this stronger. I know it. Enjoy today's episode. And welcome to the show, Andrea. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Chelly. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. Um, I was really pleased to get to know you when we both were um, speaking at Fort Collins Startup Week. And I was really excited to hear your title of um, Human Resilience Activator, which is a phenomenal hybrid title, which is what our panel was about. And I did interview Sarah Beth uh, Burke, who had us on her panel for the podcast before. So she's doing amazing work. And we both kind of live in this space of like, we have many interests and um, ways of showing up in the world. So I'm really curious to kind of hear you go back through your story and kind of tell me how you got to this awareness of, of who you are now. Yeah. Yeah. It's really that pod or that um, panel was so much fun. And Sarah Bestberg is, is really, I love what she's doing, bringing the concept of, you know, the concept of the racial intersectionality, racial and um, sexual orientation and religion, all of that into a professional space because so many people 
do find that professional job titles are not enough to express their full identity. So that's, and I know that yours, you express yourself as a spark plug. Tell me <laughs> the, the, I forget yeah. exactly what yours was, but it was um, spiritual spark plug, spiritual spark plug, which is so <laughs> you, <laughs> it's so you. Yeah. So, um, human resilience activator. I think that I, I came up with that as my hybrid pro- professional title, because when I look back on my past and about all the all the different jobs that I've had and the common thread, it really was that um, I, my focus has always been about understanding someone's barriers to achieving their goals and then becoming a sort of cheerleader for them and digging into the, the heart of the barriers. So what's really stopping them and then kind of activating that spark in them to say, I can get over this. I can, you know, surpass this, whether it's, your, you know, socioeconomic status, if it's, you know, if you've struggled with poverty in the past, which I've worked with a lot of, so my background is in, excuse me, is in higher ed administration. And for a long time, I was helping first generation and low income students to get to college. So doing pre collegiate programs and working with families. And so really navigating uh, the world of higher education can be super mystifying when you're applying for, you know, the financial aid package and admissions and doing the essays. Um, and especially if your English is not your first language, it's really challenging. And so for a lot of people, they have these um, not only very real barriers like language um, or finances, if they can't necessarily afford college, um, but even the, um, the cultural capital that they may be lacking. Um, so if you're the first in your family to go to college, you just don't know how that process works. It's just very mystifying. And so a lot of my um, work path was really about helping to be almost a translator for people. And so human resilience activator, I think I realize the activation piece is goes to the fact that I'm really great at being that cheerleader and being there for them in that moment of the barrier. Um, but I'm less about that continuous in the weeds, um, you know, how do I say kind of a taskmaster type of a thing? Like I'm, I'm the one who says go forth <laughs> yeah. and do it and go. And then I'm on to the next person. So um, really that's where that human really resilience activator is. And, uh, and the resilience piece, especially now during COVID, I think um, I find that a lot of people are just getting stuck in old paradigms of their identity or old paradigms of the way work needs to be uh, the way professional, um, a professional path needs to look. And so resilience is a lot about flexibility and getting into, um, a a deep understanding of who you really are in the world. And so that's, I think that's where that title came from. I love that. And, and I resonate with you in terms of being the activator and the spark plug. It's like getting people on that journey, right? Like it's, it's that bridge between, I know I want to be there. I have no clue how to get there. And so like having that cheerleader, having that person who's like, here's your ground knowledge and go. Yeah. That I think <laughs> is, is an incredible space to be in. And I'm curious, like, as you came to this point, were there things that happened in your life that just revealed to you like, wow, there actually is a need for this. It doesn't just happen. And it doesn't, you know, it's not easy for everybody. What was that um, realization like for you? Yeah. Um, well, so the for the past four years, I've run a business. I started a business in 2016. I left my career in higher education. And so the business is called Ever Human. And I've been helping older adults in the digital age to thrive in the digital age. So I've been providing technology training and um you know, online, in-person consulting to help older adults. And it's been really great. And yet now with COVID, I have found my business completely at a standstill. And it's been one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. When I did my taxes for 2019, I cried myself to sleep that night Mm -hmm. thinking, how could I have worked, you know, all this time and made so little money And now that I can't even show up for clients, what does that mean for me at this moment? So uh, in terms of having a realization of of what people need or what I even need right now, uh, it came down to looking at my finances, looking at the prospects for this business, realizing they're not great, and then having to sit with that and say, well, what does that mean in terms of my worth and my value? You know, how does that reflect back on me? Am I a failure? Am I lost? Am I, um, 
was it worth it? Did I provide any value? And so I really had to take a, like 10 steps back and redefine what I see as success. And now I realize that success is one of the most damaging words you can use to measure a life um, or, a, or an endeavor, a project. It's just a very dicey word because success is a couple things. It's always a comparison no matter what. So you're either comparing your, yourself to your past self, you're comparing yourself to others, uh, you're comparing um, you know, the future, your hopes to what it is right now. And so it's always a comparison, which means you're not living in the now, right? You're not, you're, you're arguing with reality in some way. You're not dealing with what is. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's always a judgment. So it's less than, more than, uh, and that just can be really difficult. So I had to come to terms with that for myself and realize that I'm not, it's not productive for me to worry about whether or not ever human or anything else that I've done in the past is successful. Moving forward, I want to be aligned, right? I want to figure, and you and I have talked about this before, but this idea that if I can, if I can get clear on my values, on my relationships, on uh, the purpose that I have in this world, if I can get clear on those things, I, I sort of imagine this as a top. And I think I had said this to you before, but uh, if you think about the way a top moves, if a top is going to spin, uh, it's only going to keep spinning if it's aligned with its with its North Star, right? right. With its center, it's going to keep spinning. But the top doesn't spin itself. It gets spun by something. Let's imagine that's like life force or the universe. It gets spun mm-hmm. by something. And if it tried to move itself, it probably would get out of alignment. It would get all jerky, right? It has to flow. You have to actually have some, some level of surrender Mm -hmm. with this, with the energy that's pulling you. And your job is to stay aligned, to stay upright. And so you do that by being really clear about your values, your beliefs, your, who you want to serve, what you're about. And then, um, this has been my little trick for surviving COVID is, following the next sparkling crumb. So if I see something on LinkedIn that kind of looks interesting, I'll go check it out. If I hear, you know, a podcast of something that, you know, oh, that kind of sparks my interest. Not only do I follow it, but I sort of take note of the things that are sparking my interest right now, because I really think that, that your instincts, when you are in that place of surrender, your instincts are going to pull you in the direction of your highest good. So I think being in surrender is the like the best way that you can eventually end up where you're supposed to be. Yes. So the analogy, the analogy of the top makes so much sense to me. And, and, and the surrender is such a, a big part of that. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm just curious of like when that moment happened for you, like talk me through when you decided that your job was to help people to find that, you know, to, to help them get to that space of, of, um, going to across the bridge, if you will, to go back to um, a previous analogy that we used. Yeah. So I would say that it was less about a moment when I realized this is what people need and more about a reflection on my past. So as I'm, as I'm thinking about um, where I want my future to go, which is really up in the air right now, (laughs) I'll be really honest. I'm, I'm in a place of, I don't want to say lost because, um, you know, that can kind of imply a scary place, but I would just say on a, on a pause with needing to be very, um, I'm not ready to choose yet. I'm, I'm in a place of, of discovery and exploration. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so in this time I've looked back and said, huh, I, one of the key things that I've always done for people is to be a human resilience activator. So, you know, I, I honed that phrase based on the invitation to participate in this panel, because I I am a person who I would define myself as a hybrid professional. And so that was one of the things that we were really asked to do is kind of put words to it. So her workbook, uh, Sarah Beth Burke's workbook is really great for doing that. So I used the workbook to to discover that. And that may have been a a moment of clarity for me. It's really just reflecting on the past and saying, well, what what have I always done naturally? Right. And so I think it was less of a moment and more of an evolution and an awakening to what I've always done naturally. Can you share a story or a personal anecdote about how that showed up for you? And, uh, you know, maybe it's, I'm sure you've changed plenty of lives. I I believe that, but I I, I just kind of want to hear it from your perspective, how uh, like a specific way that happens. 
Boy, that's a great question. Um, a specific moment. I, I will say that when I look back, my, back at my friendships, my, my friends have always had times where they say to me, oh my gosh, you just have made me feel so ready to take on the world. After talking to you, I, I get it now. I see my worth. I see where I want to go. Uh, so that's, you know, I don't know if that's a moment or an instant so much as just a pattern. Yeah, um, I see. And the same with, boy, I'm trying to think of a specific story, but... Um, it's more the patterns that come to the surface. And that makes sense. Like, I get it. It, it. You remember more that connection that was made and it keeps happening. So you're like, oh, that is the clue for me that this is something that I actively can can do on, on purpose, right? To, to help people. So that that's fantastic. And so talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned COVID had a lot to do with kind of shifting what's going on in your life and career right now. What has it meant for you to be um, living during this time? For me, it's been a lot of noticing. So I am noticing that it's a lot of things are falling apart. So not just in my own life, but around you know, oh, yes. race relations around politics, around around people's kind of stuck definitions of what work has to be, uh, around education. And so I am I'm being very observant right now as to the things that are falling apart. And what I'm noticing is that those who are fighting to hold on to what was are really struggling. Right. And those who are being very adaptable and flexible and open to what could be are are embracing the moment as an opportunity to try something new and try on a new hat. So I know for me, that's definitely where my head has been. I'm reading, I've got four books in front of me that um, are like on my nightstand right now. And three of them are um, The Law of Divine Compensation, mm -hmm. Marianne Williams. Marianne, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, Williamson, sorry, Designing Your Work Life and The Fourth Industrial Revolution. So all of those books are, are kind of a, a glimpse into where my head is at right mm. now. But really yeah. in, um, what I love about designing your work life, for example, is talking about the good enough for now. <laughs> so I think that that's a really interesting way to prototype possible, uh, careers. So I'm doing that right now where I'm kind of taking on, uh, different side projects, different, um, job applications that may have felt like that's not really what I've done in the past, but let me try that on. What could be good enough for now? What could be an interesting way to pivot? Um, also this idea of, they talk about savoring and coherence. So savoring is really just, it's another way to say gratitude, really. It's a way to look around and saying, instead of cramming more into your life, how can you get more out of what you already have? Yeah. Um, I'm really in that space because I had, um, I had shared with you earlier that I had applied for a job that was going to be a a really extraordinarily large compensation for what I've ever had in the past, <laughs> um, you know, double what I've ever made in the past. And um, I didn't get that job. And, and in not getting that job, I had a, a lot of reflections. And one of them is that savoring. So, uh, you know, I don't have that fat paycheck right now. But what does that mean for my, like, what kind of richness and wealth do I have? I have a wealth of time. I have a wealth of love. I have a wealth of relationships, of health. You know, those things are are very valuable. So that's another reflection I've been taking off of COVID is, is to recognize the wealth that I do have um, and the stability that I have, even if it's, you know, even if it's an unsteady time, there are things in my life that are very stable. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to what you were saying about what, what is the measure of success? Yeah. It, it's not just compensation. And, and I think in our society, that is maybe the number one thing people look to, like how much money is in my account? That's how valuable I am. And, um, you know, in a time that's so financially devastating for so many in industries that literally have no life right now, all the arts, the events, you know, sports in some ways, you know, it's, it's impossible to really fully grasp how, like how widespread this devastation is. And so if our, as a culture, our main, you know, metric for success is, is monetary, then there's a lot of people with really low self-esteem right now. And that, that's not right. So how do we show up every day and for ourselves and, and model for others of, of, of doing exactly what you're doing, right? Of, of seeing the value in the multiple areas of life that we have. And yeah, I think reading those books is a, is a great way to do it. And, and would you have any other thoughts or advice on 
people who are in this like strange new world they're dealing with? (laughs) Yeah, I would say, um, so I've been really championing the book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's actually written, I think it was written in 2016. So it's not super new. What I love about it is that it really is a very great description of the times that we're in right now. So we are, we passed through the industrial revolution, you know, the age of steam, the age of, and then the digital revolution was really about computerization, right? Using computers as tools, word processors, and things like that. The fourth industrial revolution is where technology meets biology. And so what that means is smartwatches, internet of things, AI, um, you know, all the ways that we are in social media, the ways that we're using technology to express ourselves and to connect. And so that's very different than using technology as a simple tool. And what that means is it's really going to, it is already drastically changing what work looks like now and into the future. So I encourage people to look at this because it really outlines, um, you know, some people may have the misconception that as technology matures, it means we all have to be super duper techie. And that's not true. What, it, what actually is happening is that technology is becoming so sophisticated that it's becoming easier and easier to use and it's becoming just integrated seamlessly in our lives. So you don't actually have to be super techie. What you have to be is emotionally, emotionally intelligent yes. and yeah. flexible and adaptable. Um, and so these, you know, the skill of empathy, the things that computers can't do and will never be able to do are going to be the, the industries that are going to thrive. So, um, helping industries, healthcare, yes. uh, education, care services, like elder care, child care, those kinds of, uh, industries are going to be in high demand where, um, this, you know, the coders of the world may or may not be as important in the future, like a segment will be, but computers are becoming so smart that computers may be able to code themselves in the future, right? And so it's really, you have to think about um, the soft skills, we call them the soft skills, right? Those are the skills that are going to be very important in the future. And that's good news for a lot of people. That's an opportunity for a lot of people. So I think that that's, um, it's worth checking out. It's worth looking into that idea. And so how would you relate that back to value and how we value ourselves, whether it's, you know, monetary versus the other ways that we show up in life? Is it, is it just, are you seeing this like as a trend because the soft skills are going to be more valuable in the future because we are starting to value those qualities more than just like the hardline non-emotional stuff? Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. I think that the opportunity lies, you know, if you are feeling like you are lacking hard skills in any kind of a tech sort of a thing, or um, I think that it's, it's an opportunity for people to realize that they probably have more value than they realize in terms of the skills that they can bring to the table. The important thing is being the skill of being a lifelong learner. There are so many different free platforms to learn right now. Right. You know, there's LinkedIn learning. There is, there's MOOCs that are online, massive open online courses. There is, um, edX, there's just so many places that you can learn. So by demonstrating that you're a lifelong learner, that can be really marketable right now. And in terms of, you know, financial compensation, it's important. But even as I, you know, as I, (laughs) I'll be honest, I struggle with holding a balance between what I quote unquote should be compensated for based on my education or credentials. Mm -hmm. And the value that I just want to bring to the world and the, um, the non-monetary compensation that I could be getting back. Because yes. if I hold so tightly onto an expectation of a particular dollar amount, I might really miss out on the joy that could come from bringing my skills to life in another capacity that maybe will pay less. So I think it's, um, on one hand, we should, we should strive towards fair compensation and, um, you know, making sure that we are maximizing that potential as much as we can. And we just can't define ourselves by it. 
absolutely. And it's, it's also finding the importance of the quality of life. And it's interesting how during this time, you know, people have been told, oh, you can't work from home. It's just not doable. Well, guess what? Everybody's working from home right now. It is doable. And for some people, because I don't think the nine to five is for everyone. And I think there should be flexibility in terms of how people do their job. And there shouldn't be such a tight puritanical, like it must be this time to this time. And you must take that 30 minute lunch with no extra moment. And it doesn't leave room for every type of working personality or the way that certain people's creativity comes through. It's like, do you get the job done? Do you get the job done? Well, great. You're doing Mm -hmm. it. And, um, and I think that a lot of these structures that have been taken, you know, as fact for so long are not going to be facts anymore. They're going to be options. And I think if um, companies are going to evolve and thrive in this future that that's being created right now, they're going to have to allow for flexibility for that. And um, I don't think we're ever going back from it. That's just my prediction. You are totally right on. It's so interesting how all these things people said were impossible are suddenly being done (laughs) with ease, right? With, you know, relative ease. There, of course, was a shock in the beginning, but it is amazing how uh, we're really being proven wrong about a lot of our paradigms that we thought were just, you know, you can't trust workers to work from home. Right. And and these, like you said, these changes are going to be permanent. They're not going to, we're not going to go back because people aren't going to want to go back. Uh, companies, frankly, aren't going to want to go back. They're now realizing, you know, they they had to dive head first. And now they're saying, wow, actually our, our the productivity has increased right. in many cases. And it's also been a very revealing time. I, I keep hearing from friends of how like the things that were wrong before are on stark display now because you can't hide or get away from it. The things like not being able to speak truth to power, the barriers between the people who are on the ground who like totally understand what's happening out there and not being able to to share that because it's not their place. And it's it's the system is broken. How can I help? I've got the information for you. And there's so many like, nope, that we can't do that. They won't let me. And and I think that's something that uh, needs to change as well. And it's I think it's something that will because it's not allowing for a healthy work environment. If the the head of the snake has no idea what's going on at the tail and is making decisions and and you know barking orders down saying this is how it's going to be without actually checking in with the entire you know the whole of what's happening that to me um is a model that is just not sustainable oh i couldn't agree more i think that it's uh <laughs> it's really in some ways this moment has a democratizing force because a lot of um a lot of the old ways, like you're saying, the, the the head of the snake, I love that, the head of the snake not knowing what the tail is doing, it's not possible in this moment. You have to have more transparency or you're not going to get the job done. You That's have right. to share more, right? Like you have to uh, create transparency in in everything so that the job gets done working from home or whatever you know configuration you have to do. So yeah, I, I agree with that completely. There's, you know, it's strange times we're in, but I think there's definitely, you know, positives that can come from that. And it's, it'll be really interesting, you know, a year from now to see, to see where we are. So, you know, give me a little insight as to, you know, how people can connect with you should they want to know more about your work and, you know, uh, feel free to, to share like what you're excited about in terms of the journey that you're currently on with your work right now. Yeah. Thanks. So I am, what am I most excited about? I'm excited that if I look around I think a lot of people are very open to new possibilities and I want to be a part of that. So I'm thinking about how can I use my previous experience to help, you know, being a human resilience activator, helping people through this fourth industrial revolution and understanding what that is. So that's one of the, I have a talk on that, that I love to give to to organizations. So that's one way people can connect with me. Uh, And yeah, so people, the best way to connect with me is through LinkedIn right now. Uh, So Andrea Bazwan, my last name is B-A-Z-O-I-N. It's French. A lot of people say, what? I don't understand. How how do you say that is Bazwan? So um, that's how people can connect with me best. That's fantastic. Well, I'm really grateful for your time today. And thank you for sharing your unique insight on what's happening uh, in your world and the world and what's to come. I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really love what you're doing in the world and being that spiritual spark plug. I think it's so needed. And uh, I hope people share your podcast widely because it's, it's really important. That means so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Lighthouse Conversations. If this show resonates with you, it would mean so much to have you rate, review, and share. Don't forget to follow us at ChelliCanales.com and on social media.